Now, I'll just explain to you what's happening, basically. Very attractive woman there, right from the start. <laughs> very, very good-looking girl, I've always thought. So handsome, we've had to black her face out, right? <laughs> Let me tell you what's happening. Like this on any of the podcasts that I've done, um, and this isn't really a podcast sort of in keeping with the themes that I've done, it's a really bizarre thing that happened. So, you've obviously just seen a, a cut down version of the clip that came up on my TikTok that was Bob Mills from 90s television, and he has he was a presenter at Talk Sport for ages. I know who he is, I knew who he was before I seen that clip. I used to watch that TV program, I've watched a few things that Bob Mills did. Um, the the woman that got assaulted on that um, was my mother, and that is from a documentary that I was in, that I knew about, that I don't really revisit, and I don't really tell a lot of people. I don't really talk about my mum to a lot of people, so it's a bit strange that this has come about, and I'm now putting it out there, uh, which I'm not really asked, but it's, it's not something I was planning to do. But uh, after I saw that, I was really pissed off. That there was a TV audience in 1992 laughing at the fact that my four foot eleven mother was being assaulted. So I called Bob Mills out on Twitter. Fair play to Bob. Bob responded pretty pretty quickly, um, and he sent me a sincere apology. He could tell that it was well thought out. This was a few months ago, so we've been we've been in contact for a couple of months. And from there, he asked if he could come on and do. A po- he'd seen the podcast that I've been doing, and he asked if he could come on and do one with me. So we've done one, uh, you know, we talk about that clip at the start of it and then we sort of get into regret, changing, um, Bob was homeless for a period of time and a few other bits and bobs, just life in general and I hope you enjoy it, I guess. From the outside looking in podcasts, uh, I'm Ricky Gleason. I have a guest today, Bob Mills, Talk Sport, well I hear you on Talk Sport, Talk Radio as well. Um Night these TV, win, lose, or draw. We'll get on to that. Right. Uh, and in bed with me dinner. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is which is that let's 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 start straight away, Rick. Yeah, yeah. It's it's nice to talk to you for the, this is the first time we've actually spoken. Yeah. But we yeah. we've we've been in touch for about a couple of months now. Yeah, yeah. So let's <laughs> let's get that straight out of the way and let's Explain to the people watching this because I think it's quite unusual. It is very how, unusual. Yeah, how it's we very came unusual. to make contact. Yeah, it's the very first un- contact we had. It's very unusual. I think the way because it's so unusual, I think that's half of why it affected me so much. Mm. So I was lying in bed, um, and as I do, I opened my phone up and I put I open TikTok. Do you know TikTok? I'm aware of it. I yeah, so I open TikTok. It, yeah. it just the moment you open it, it plays a video. And as soon as this video came on, my, it's hard to explain, but my blood sort of went cold and I was in shock because I knew straight away what I was looking at. Um, And I was looking at a video of yourself presenting a show in the 90s called In Bed With Me Dinner, which I knew, I recognised it because I used to watch it. Uh, But the so the way you used to present that show is you had a little TV next to you. And on the TV, as soon as I saw it, I knew what I was watching. And then I progressed to watch it and... It was, for all intents and purposes, it was yourself and a studio audience laughing at a documentary and making jokes about a documentary where a woman was being assaulted. During the the segment that you watched, a a woman got assaulted by somebody that rang on the door randomly and grabbed her by her hair and threw her to the floor. Um, That woman was four foot eleven. The guy that attacked her was well over six foot. I know she was four foot eleven because that was my mother. Right. So, so, okay. So that was the point of contact. Yes. So it, it, here's the thing. If you're in, uh, you know, you're on television, you're in the media. Yeah. Uh, or in, in comedy, as I am. It is something that happens sometimes. Sometimes you tell a joke. Okay? Yeah. Say I'm at a club or something, you tell a joke. And someone says, oh, I didn't like that joke. I was offended by that joke. Yeah. Okay. And your attitude is kind of, well, I'm really sorry that you came to a comedy club and you happened to get offended. Yes. You know, but these, you know, these things happen and, and I'm quite a mild mannered and uh, try and be pleasant to people and say, well, I'm sorry. If you, I'm sorry if you're offended. 
I'm not apologising for the joke. No. Because that's my job. I wouldn't it's, say I was offended, Bob. No, no, no. Yeah. But hey, this is what I'm saying. I, I'm coming to you in a second. Yeah. And I would say to a normal punter at a comedy club, I'm sorry if you're offended. Maybe you're in the wrong place and, and, and move on from there. However, if someone contacts you and says, I watched something that you did and I was hurt, not offended, yeah. very deeply hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you've got two choices. You can either, you've got three actually. You can either argue with the person, which yeah. you would never do. You can ignore it. That's the easy thing to do. It's the easiest thing in the world to ignore a comment on Twitter or, or on you just or, or on, you just move on and it's it spools away and in a week or so you've forgotten all about it. Or, and I felt this very strongly, you 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 answer the person and you say, Tell me, tell me what I've done that's offend that's hurt you, because I don't mind offending people. Yeah. The idea of, of hurting someone. Yeah, well, like I said, I wasn't, different thing. I wasn't offended. And you no. know, the thing that I was going to say to you is, yeah, it made me angry. But actually, the, the big thing that it made me, it made me really sad. And I don't say mm. that as in, oh, I feel sorry for me, because it's very no. rare. That, it's very rare that I feel like that. Um, but it really, it really upset me because you're laughing at my, it's not just you. I was yeah. looking at the studio audience yeah. and you, you're laughing at my mum being assaulted on yeah. TV. And then on top of that, I'm in the background. I can hear myself. I know that that documentary is out there. I know that it's on YouTube. I know it can be found. I'm aware of it. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. it, it's something that I avoid because like I said, my mum went on in life to become a very bad alcoholic. Um, I'm not going to pretend she was the greatest mother. She wasn't, but she took her own life. And mm. uh, part of my grieving thing is that, I avoid it. I haven't got pictures of her anywhere. You know, I, I tend not to visit it unless I want to visit it. Do you know what I mean? If, if I go and visit a grave, you thought I've been there twice. Um, but it's something that I avoid. And then to suddenly open my TikTok and just the weirdness of it all to be hit with that. Yeah. First of all, I'm like, well, that's my mum. So that's already upset me. And then, yeah, you know, there's no way of avoiding the fact that there was yourself and a, a studio audience all laughing. Sure. And the thing is, is, when I watched it, I will say this. I got the feeling the joke was more about the guy assaulting yeah. him, how much of a scumbag yeah. he was. It, 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 but here's it's, the still, thing. it's still my mother. Exactly. Here, here's the thing. What, what, what it was about, okay, and I'm, this isn't a defence I'm laying down because, you know, I, I, I'm not defending. You've apologised properly. Yeah. So, but yeah. here's the thing. What it was, it was what the people were laughing around. And yeah. This is shameless, but it's true. We were laughing at these people who had this terrible life. Yeah. They Which were was drunk and they were living in squalor. And isn't this funny? How yeah. these isn't it funny that people like this exist? Okay. Now, again, that's something that you did. You put it up, it was on the telly and it was out there. The important thing is here, and this is this is an incredibly important thing that's happened to me, is that someone comes to you 15, 20 years later and says, you know that thing that you did? It had consequences. That person was a real person. Yeah. She happened to be my mother. Yeah. She had a very sad life and she took her own life and, and it was really hurtful. And what that does is it doesn't make you think that I regret everything I've ever done in my life on a terrible person, but it makes you think everything you do has a consequence. Yeah. And it makes you think, okay, there, but there is something I can do. There is one little thing I can do. It's not much, but it's something I can do. I can say, I apologize. Yeah, which, you know. And that, but that is a really important thing, I think. Yeah, I do as well. And I'll be honest, when you apologize, that you're saying, when I contacted you, you said that you had some choices to make. When you apologize, yeah. I had some choices to make as well. Because, as you know, I was tweeting you. <laughs> in a very few places to try and get your attention yeah. and then i saw and then i saw that you were following me so from there i'm like right well i know i know he knows i exist now so i'm sort of winding myself up a bit more do you know what i mean and i'm inboxing you but then you sent a well a very well thought out apology that was the thing that struck me is that it wasn't just ah oh, sorry mate it was a very sort of detailed explanation and then i was left with a choice right what do i do here what is it that i actually want you know am i just calling you out to argue with you call your names, whatever, do you know what I mean? Have it out and just, do you know what I mean? Just keep that cycle right. Or 
what did I want? Did I want an apology? Have I got an apology? Now do I accept the apology? So I, you know, decided to accept the apology, which I think was the right thing to do. Still annoyed. Do you know what I mean? There's no no getting away mm. from it. It's, it's still annoying. It's annoying that it's out there, but it is out there. And, you know, the big part of your apology was that you, you pointed out that it's a long time ago that I think that would have been about 1992. And people do change. Um, and I don't mean like drastically change. No. I just mean people sort of become a bit, as we get older, I find you become a bit more sort of, what's the word? Emp- empath- empathetic. Empathetic. Yeah. 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 You become more empathetic. You understand that actually your actions hurt people. I know you've seen the first podcast where we're talking about some of the stuff that I used to get up to. Mm. Um, so you've done, from my point of view, the reason why I sort of have to forgive people for misdemeanors in the past is because I've got so many myself. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, I mean, I've got a lot. And mine involved <laughs> mine involved taking people's property, fighting yeah. with people, mugging people. I've handbags snatched. I've, I've done all sorts of scummy things when I was a 16, 17-year-old. Um, so if, you know, if I have to sort of compartmentalise my stuff and move on and say, well, I've changed, I kind of have to accept it when other people do. So... Thank you for apologising. Apology accepted. No, well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, um, I, it, but it was an interesting thing on a, on a slightly wider level now. Yeah. What it what it it made me think a lot about social media. I'm quite new to social media. I, yeah. I I, I I had to join. I started doing a show for talk uh, radio. Yeah. About I think it's about four or five years ago now. But one of the things they say is, can you get a social media presence? Yeah. Can you join Twitter? Can you join? Uh, I think that's all I'm on. Uh, just Twitter. Yeah, yeah, that is all you're on. That's yeah. all you're on. Uh, and I, for the first kind of year or so, I just used to go into it and think, oh, crazy, it's full of nutters. They're yeah, all crazy yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. And then occasionally you think, well, hang on a minute. Now, this person's, this person here is actually making a valid point. And you would, you would engage. And I've actually found it to be somewhere that, if you want it to be, it can be a very healthy place. But you have to you have to have certain you have to make certain promises to yourself. Yeah. And that is if I engage with someone, I can't then just say, I'll forget it and cut off. You know, if if somebody says something and I say, Oh, there's a really interesting point that you made, and we're following each other, explain it a bit more. And then they explain it a bit more. You can't then just say, say oh, well, I'm not going to, I don't, I now don't agree with them. So I'm not going to contact with them. You, you, you kind of just like a conversation in real life, there comes a point where you either have to say, do you know what? I think you're wrong or I think you're right. And, and, you know, and so I'm now someone who agrees with you, but it's, it's, it's too easy on social media to say something and walk away. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so like, it's funny because you see all this stuff about trolls and um, yeah, like you know, especially during the World Cup, all this stuff about the England, the Black England players and mm. stuff. And I just, I with with social media, I made a decision a long time ago to just you can't, I can't let myself let strangers upset me. Do you know what I mean? Like, so which is why when I saw that thing on TikTok, it was why it was it's why it upset me so much because it's so rare that I let social media bother me. Social media is not real to me. So when people are calling me names, etc., it, it really is. It, it doesn't, it doesn't upset me. It doesn't hurt me. It doesn't offend me. I don't know these people. I'm never going to see them. If I did see them, they wouldn't say that to your face. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a strange, it's a strange world, social media. Um, but it, it can be used for good. And, you know, like the thing that we said in the inbox is that um, it, it's rare that two people on social media sort of have that kind of dispute that we were having yeah and both behave quite grown up about it i think i think we both behave quite grown up about it immediately yeah. I, I mean when i was calling you out kind of thing and twitter I, you know i was i was angry and i was trying to get your attention um and that's why i was sort of posting on everything you'd ever posted on twitter i was dropping my comments trying to get your attention but as soon as you got your attention we discussed it you you sort of sent your apology i accepted my apology explain i'm not about cancel culture it was never about trying to get you in trouble at work or anything like that it was literally just you know i want to i wanted to know what the crack was with this tv yeah. program well, in fact, I, mean? it, I, so, I found it i found it quite uh, a good opportunity because it gave me the opportunity because a lot of people tweet me and say, ah, oh, like, in bed with dinner, should bring that back, I should love it. 
and I and I kind of don't say it, but what I think about it is, yeah, a lot of it was very good, but a lot of it was schneid. Yeah, well, you said you said I don't want to go over the because apparently no. it was sort of between us, but you did say there's a lot about that show that you're not comfortable with anymore. Yeah, which uh, you know, there's a lot about my past that I'm not comfortable yeah. with. But anymore. let me tell you, just yeah. and, and then we'll move on. But there's one thing in particular. Well, there's two things now. You the, the thing with you, your your mum, which I wasn't aware of until you told me. But there was a guy on there called Paul Sykes, and he's quite a famous. I know who Paul Sykes is yeah. the the boxer. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll punch him in here. I'll tell you about sharks. You yeah. punch him in here. Yeah. And I had a fabulous time uh, with the Paul Sykes documentary. It was right. such a, a rich vein of. Was was that you that <coughs> shot that? No, 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 no. no. no I'm, I lied about making. Oh right, okay, got you, got you, got but, you. But yeah. but watching it, yeah, I got like a show and a half out. Yeah, yeah. Everything he said was ridiculous. Yeah, you could yeah. Make fun of this, and you could make fun of that, and. And he's become kind of a cult through In Bed With Medina. And people say, I saw that. I went and watched the document. What an idiot, the guy. (laughs) Well, a few years ago, I'm walking through uh, a market in South London, and someone came up to me and said, Ian Mills are here. You'll love this. I've just seen this on the store, bought it. You'll love it. And they gave me a copy of a book that he wrote. He wrote a book called Sweet Agony. Yeah. And it's kind of a biographical look at his life and it's written he wasn't a literate man right but he re- he wrote it and he got a publisher to, to, to publish it and it is absolutely heartbreaking yeah because i and i suddenly realized oh my god this guy who was wallowing about drunk and talking nonsense there was a reason for it when you read about his background of course he turned into a drunk because everyone he was associated with was a drunk. Yeah. From 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 a very early age. And of course he turned into this person because society deemed that he should be nothing else than this useless, thieving, lying. But in fact, he managed to fight for a, for a British title. You know, yeah, I, I, I know a fair bit about it. I know that, um, I mean, both so in fact, what yeah. he achieved was incredible compared to the chances that he had, and but, that that is one of the many, not the many, but one of the things that about that program. I think I wish I'd known that before we did all that stuff, yeah. So, it's, again, with that whole documentary with me, with me, mum, I know the backstory, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Of course, you do. I, I you know, I know <clears throat> that. That was my real life. Those, and, and you're right to point out that, you know, they weren't exactly the, the greatest of human beings, if you like, in our society. That was what I was growing up with. They're, they're mm. the people that raised me, you know. All that chaos that you saw for that little second and sort of got a joke out of. Yeah. That, that was my real life. Do you know what I mean? And I, I didn't fare too well. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, I'm all right now. But if you'd met me at 15, 16, it was clear that all of that had culminated in turning to me into pretty bad human being that was doing not very good things. So, yeah. But and anyway. yeah, so that, that's how we met. Yeah. <clears throat> that's how we came into contact. Yeah. And the, the great irony is now is that you from that background I yeah. sitting with this beautiful display of porcelain china behind you. Welsh dresser. And, <laughs> Welsh dresser. And I look for all the world like I'm hiding out in the Chilean well, embassy. Does a Welsh dresser make me middle class? Because that's what we're going <laughs> for. I'm Without trying. a doubt. Mm. And the little and the little football trophy. Boxing trophy, that. Oh, is it a boxing trophy? Yeah. There's a very uh, there's a very funny American comic called Paul Provenza who used to do this stuff where he used to say, <sighs> what a waste my life's been. I've spent hours in the gym practicing. I've spent hours on the golf course practicing. I've practiced this. I've practiced that. Darts, billiards, I've practiced it all. I went to get my shoes repaired the other day, and I realized you can buy all them trophies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got that from a white collar. <laughs> you know, a, a noddy fight oh, in Newcastle. So. White collar boxing. Yeah. Yeah, that is that's what someone really make, should make a documentary about. Right, that's one yeah. of the last great gladiator sports. Just throw two people yeah. in the ring. Together. Throw a, a, give, a guy give, from them, give them give them nine hours of training. He's just like, I know. Well, I mean, I box. I could. Well, I train and I spar and I know how to box. So the way that I describe myself is, I know how to box. I'm just not very good at actually doing it. Do yeah. You know what I mean. So, but yeah, I mean, some of them. 
Yeah, oh, it's, it's, I've, it's I've done I've done shows, corporate shows, because yeah. the corporate people love it because there's nothing more than corporate, you know, the bankers and hedge funds management love than to sit with, a, you know, a two grand bottle of wine, yeah. a table in the in the Grosvenor house, watching uh, a kid from Rongford and, and, and a young Romanian lad beating seven colours out of each other. Yeah. They, they, you know, it's it's to them, it's a good night's entertainment. And uh, you watch some of them and you think, Anywhere other than this room, this is illegal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I love boxing. It's my favourite sport. Uh, it used to be football, but it's morphed into boxing. I've got old, Has it? You've yeah. moved from football to Yeah, boxing. yeah. So, I mean, I'm still a Newcastle United fan. And I still, uh, obviously, it's a very exciting time for the tune at the moment. Um, but in general, I, I, you know, I used to watch all football. And now I barely watch it. I'll watch the Newcastle. I might catch the highlights. I'll, you know, I'll watch England in a tournament, but I don't. Watching a but boxing, I'll you know I'll sit up till four or five in the morning to watch boxing fight. No bother, spend too much money on it. All right, um, let me ask you this, and then we will move on to the okay. serious stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well. As a Newcastle fan, yes, I know what you're going to ask. Yeah, good. No, uh, uh, you you came to terms with where the money was coming from. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, people yeah. people do that. Uh, um, the fact that Man City fans are complaining. Yeah. You know, forget that. But. When you had come to terms with it and yeah. thought, well, whatever, we now have apes, peacocks, and half half your kingdom. We have untold wealth. Yeah. Did you think ah, we're really lucky? We might get Eddie Howe. Well, I'll tell you what. I wanted Eddie Howe ages ago. So, but I, I'll be honest. I wanted Eddie Howe when Mike Ashley was in charge. And yeah. We knew we weren't going to get anybody massive. I I'm still hopeful. I think Eddie Howe's a really good coach. Um. I think everybody talks about the fact that he got relegated, but what he did before he got relegated was insane with Bournemouth. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it was. It, you know, the and, worry is to get Bournemouth. Yeah. What did he do at Burnley? Well, you know, but he he's walked young. in and he walked out. Again. He, he, he's he's young. He is, you know, a really young coach. Um, I think he might be the right man for the job at the moment. Who knows what the future holds? Uh, you know. We'll see, but it's just nice. It's nice to be having these conversations instead of talking about Steve Bruce, who I don't want to get too much into because I will be accused of one of the people that was really mean about him. So, Bruce, <laughs> you know, Bruce, Brucey Ball has now left Newcastle. Yeah. So, anyway, right, right, let's get on to the come on. This isn't what this podcast no, is about. No, this so, podcast isn't about people getting on well and chatting nice. No, come on, no, um. Well, do you know, first of all, I was going to say that I used to watch, yeah, I've already said I used to watch in bed when we did it. So that was one of the things I had to deal yeah, with. Yeah, you well, hypocrite. Because, yeah, so, you know, and I, I admit that to myself. I was like, well, I used to watch this. And I told my mate about it. And he was like, Bob Mills in bed when we did it. I loved it. Um, so I've obviously laughed at people's misfortunes as well. And then I think, is that, was that 90s culture just in general? I'm a, I'm a 90s child. I'm 44. So I sort of grew up, came of age in the 90s, um, you know, from teenager to sort of early 20s. And 90s culture was very, very Larry, very loud, mm. calling everybody a wanker and all that. Wanker of the week on words. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It, it was a very sort of, so was, you know, was your TV show just part of the culture that we yes. had of laughing at <clears throat> the misfortune of others yeah. back then, you know? Yeah, I'm sorry, but it, but it was. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that culture was very much part of that. It was a very strident. I mean, if you look today, I mean, it's not that long ago, the 90s. No, it's really no, no. not that young. If you were born in the 90s, you're a young person. Yeah. So it's not that long ago. But the idea in the 1990s that, that, that people could talk about issues and they could talk about, you know, the problems of the, the gay community and the problems of the trans community. We did, there was no trans community in, in no. the 90s. Uh, you know, and and even sort of, you know, the, the conversations about racism, the, there was there was some in the 90s. But if you were in the 90s, if you were in 1991 and looked at 2021, you would be shocked that people were having the what are you talking about gay people for? They're fine, but, you know, they get on with their life. They're not, they don't affect us, you know. And what are you talking about uh, uh, racism for? Of course, there's racism. Yeah, it's always going to be racism. That's fine. You put up with it. You know, uh, you're fat, you're ginger, you're black. That's how. It, and it, 
and, and the fact that people have moved on to the point that they said, no, it's we need to have, you know, we're having sensible discussions about these things. Yeah. There's kind of, as scary as it is, it, it kind of should give us a little bit of hope, I think, that we are capable of more than just accepting. Yeah, it. yeah, I mean, we are getting it. It's funny because I was just, as, as you were talking, I was thinking in my head, in the 90s, and, I, you know, it's sort of still called it now because we're older, but in the 90s, I had two friends. I grew up in South Shields, even though I'm from London. So I was called Cockney Ricky, and I've got two friends. One was called Fat Mick, one was called Black Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that, they didn't see that. As, or if they did, they didn't really have a choice. Do you know what I mean? That was their name. I was Cockney Ricky, even though I sort of had a northern accent and yeah. I thought that I was, from, you know, Black Ryan because he was black and his name was yeah. Ryan and Fat Mick because he was fat and his name was Mick. Yeah. And that was just the way it was then. Um, and that wouldn't happen now. I don't think the young people of today would ever conceive the idea of coming out with a general nickname that that's what they're known as. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, 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 and do it in such a way that if you had said to anyone then, you know you're you're a racist, don't you? Why? <laughs> Did you call him black? No, no, no. That's that's his name. Yeah. No, yeah. He's, it, that isn't his name. Yeah, I know. But they would argue with you to the point where well, you would. Now, hang on. What about the other Ryan? There's two Ryan. Yeah. Do you there's know white what? Ryan and the black Ryan? We I have tell, to tell them apart. I tell people this all the time. Do you know my? Because obviously on that doctor, I'm mixed race. My mum was white, as you've seen on that on the clip. Um, and I never know. I never met my dad. So I grew up in a really lower class white family until I got to a certain age. My mum would ask me to nip to the packy shop. And yeah. I'm, you know, I'm half Indian. And it was only when I got to an age where she realized I was fighting over that word. You know, I was getting jumped on by complete strangers calling me that word. I was getting into fights with people for calling me that. It was, a, you know, it's a really offensive word for me. Uh, but for her, and that's with a, an Indian son, she just didn't see it as that until you know she realized that. Yeah, it's, oh, it's, you know, eventually I'm like to my own mum. You can't. Some you of can't the arguments well, I, when I was on yeah. Talk Sport, uh, I suppose Talk Radio, we we, we talk a lot about it, in, in the subject of it. And I remember sitting in the studio once with, with Paul Parker, the brilliant Man yes. United fo footballer. Yeah. And somebody saying, of course, there is an argument that of oversensitivity. I mean, you know. I, I'm bald. I was always called baldy. I was always called jock. Yeah. You know, I was always called tubby because, and I remember Paul Parker saying, yeah, okay. Well, you refused housing because you were bald. Yeah. Were you, were you a kid spat out in the street because you were fat? No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a different. Yeah. Yeah. I always sort of argue when people and say that, you know, calling somebody a packy is exactly the same as calling someone a Brit. And I always say, how many times have you been walking along the street and somebody uses that word Brit aggressively against you from nowhere to make you feel threatened and then start fighting with you while calling you a Brit. Do you <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? So, once, you know, once they do that lots and lots of times, come and see me. Until then, don't call yeah. me Packy. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, but yeah, yeah, it was just, it was a different world, wasn't it? The 90s, yeah. it was a really different world. I think, I think a lot of older people referring to the younger generation as snowflakes a lot, but I see them getting just as upset and angry. Yeah, but here's the thing, Rick. Don't be fooled by the old people, right? Here's the argument, and you sh and this is an argument you should watch out for. Always keep one eye open for this argument. Yeah, yeah but you don't understand. I grew up in the 60s, and in the 60s, we, that's how we spoke to each other. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, the, there's a very famous football chairman who's, who's now sadly, he's passed away now, so I won't name him, but he, he was the chairman of a, of, a, of a northern football club who got in trouble because uh, he referred to Chinese people as chinky, okay, in, in, in an in a, in, in, in interoffice memo. And his defense was, look, I'm sorry, I'm in the 80s. You don't understand. That's how we used to talk. Now, it doesn't matter how you used to do it. If you were in, your in the 1950s, yeah, they spoke like that. But you also lived through the 1960s yeah. and the 1970s yeah. and the 1980s. So <laughs> you can't suspend all the time in between yeah. and say that's how we yeah. used to do it. I mean, that's like me saying, of course, I don't wear a seatbelt. Yeah, well, we never used to wear them back then. It doesn't. It doesn't matter what you used to. You don't remain stuck in one place in in like amber. You move on through the years. Yeah, yeah. So don't don't 
don't ever fall for that. Oh, that's how I'm old. That's how it used to be. Well, you know, my mum sort of proved that you, you do change. You can change because she, mm. you know, she stopped using that word because she realised how offensive it was to mm. you. know, so yeah. Um, with the regrets and stuff, I was going to ask, like, you know, do you let? It, is it just a case of which I think it will be? It's the same with me. It's a case of you move on. You've just got yeah. to put it behind you. You've got to just say, well, I wouldn't do that now. I'm sorry. For me, I know this is going to sound. For me, I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I robbed your shop. I wouldn't rob your shop now. Do you yeah. Know what I mean? Like, yeah. But and there was there's points in my life where I did feel guilty. But then there comes a point where it's like, well, me me feeling bad about things serves no purpose to anybody at all. No, exactly. And, you know, actually, no. me being a better person because of the mistakes I've made serves more of a purpose than feeling sorry. Yeah. For my uh, absolutely. Uh, people who regret. Is only that's only half a thing. You say, I really regret doing that. So yeah. okay, but that, all right, that's your thing. But what about what about the rest of the thing? Because the rest of the thing is, yeah, I regret doing it, and therefore I don't do it anymore. Yeah. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Yeah. You know, I, I regret being a racist. I really wish I wasn't. Well, then you don't regret it, then, do you? <laughs> yeah. If you're still doing it. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. So, well, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, right. Another thing, as you know, obviously my podcasts are about homelessness usually. They are, yeah. Uh, homelessness, addiction, turning your life around. And you mentioned straight away um, you were homeless for six months, but you you downplayed it straight away. You were like, well, you know, I was homeless for six months, but that's nothing compared to you. And me and my friend who was homeless, we were both like, six months is a long time to not have somebody, you know, a couple of nights. Well, is a long here's time the thing. Homeless. Here's the thing. There are two things. There are two cards that I've never played. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sometimes if you're if you're a comedian, there are, you, you look at things and think, oh, God, I wish I was American. I could do so much if I had <laughs> right. that accent. Um, and the, the two cards I've never played are the Irish card, because there are so many comics who play the Irish card. Yeah, my, my grandmother's Irish, so I can do... I can have all the Irish sensibilities and be like an Irish comic and do the yeah. stuff they do. Cause well, my, my family, my grandmother, my grandparents are Irish, yeah. but it was never part of my life. So I don't play on it. And the other thing is being homeless, you know, because if it's a good thing to have, if you're a comic to be able to say, no, I can do stuff about homelessness. I can do jokes about it because I was, you know, homeless, I, which I was, but, when I look back on it, it never seems to me like I never felt like the people you see on the streets. I don't think I was in that sort of situation. No, no. I mean, there's a common misconception, though, that you're only homeless when you're in that situation. Yes. This is uh, I mean, uh, there's. I think there's statistically, I'm pretty sure there's far more people that are sofa surfing and are living on the streets. Yes. And those people that are sofa surfing are still homeless. I, yes. set up, I set up a soup kitchen in Yeovil when I was based up there a couple of years ago, and we instantly got into disagreements with the local council because... When you provide a service like that, you're also showing that there's a problem. And then yeah. they, they sort of got to us via an email and they said, we're worried that some people are going to take some advantage of you because there's people coming down from the, the, the hostel that's just up the road and actually they, they've got somewhere to live. And my answer to that was, isn't that a homeless hostel? Yes. <laughs> you know? And they yeah. were like, yeah. And I was like, well, then they're homeless then, aren't they? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. you know, to, you, to be homeless... For me, it's far more than just living on the street. It is no. literally, it's not having a place that you call home. Yeah, I, I had a, a very interesting conversation see, this weekend with a guy. Again, I'm not going to say people's names because I'm not sure they want me to, but he's, he's quite a big deal now. Uh, he, he runs a big quiz night on, on the internet. Right. And he's spoken about his, he, he was homeless and this is one of the things that got him out of it and he's doing very well for himself now. Uh, but he was talking about when he was homeless, he never, he never felt like a homeless person. He was literally living on a park bench. Yeah. But he used to get up every morning and, and go off. And he, he made a point of never staying on the park bench during the day. He would leave just like a person would leave home and go right. to work. He went to hit what he thought was his work, which is walking around looking for money that had been dropped in the street and, and things like that. Um, but as he and he said, one of the problems he had 
was that when he eventually thought, I can't be, I can't be doing with this. You know, I can't live like this anymore. And he went to a charity. He didn't have uh, an alcohol or a drug problem. And he found it was yeah. really difficult because he went, hang on a minute. Yeah. I'm a man yeah. with no home. Yeah. Ergo, I am a homeless man. And they were like, yeah, but yeah. you sure you're not on heroin? <laughs> Honestly, oh. the stories I could tell. Like, so, I mean, when I was homeless, again, I wasn't a heroin addict to start with. I, did, I wouldn't say I was ever a heroin addict. I ended up using heroin for a couple of years. I wouldn't say I became a massive addict. But I remember before that, this was up in Newcastle, I would go to sort of the, the, the council buildings that you'd go to as a homeless person to try and get some kind of accommodation. Um, and I was bottom of the pile because I was sort of broke the misconception. You would get a lot of people, what we were talking about earlier, would be like, oh, you know, if you're... If you're not white, you'll get um you'll get a flat straight away, blah blah. Uh, it wasn't the case. But if you were a British-born male that wasn't an alcoholic, wasn't a drug addict, and you were homeless, you were the very very bottom of the pile. And they do that because they see the people above you as vulnerable. But mm. for me, I'd be like, so what you're saying is, if I go out and become a heroin addict, you'll give me somewhere to live. But if I'm fighting tooth and nail to not become a heroin addict. I have to just stay sleeping outside. So, and I've had people say, oh, well, I don't think that happened. Well, it definitely did happen. That happened to me numerous times. If, you know, yeah. as, as a British born male that wasn't a drug addict or an alcoholic, I didn't get any help. And eventually I became a drug addict and an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, I wonder how much of, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I sort of see why they do it. Um, I understand girls would go before sort of males in that kind of environment because it's, yeah, as I'm going to be doing a podcast with a friend of mine as a female talking about the differences between being a male that's homeless and a female that's homeless. Uh, they're in a far more vulnerable position. And I think they should get the help first. But for me, like, why is anybody else getting prioritised above myself when I'm sort of, you know, I, I'm just as desperate as everybody else. So yeah. I, I don't know how it works these days because no, I, I haven't but it is a weird a thing. It is a weird thing when you think, now, hang on, let's just, let's forget about everything. And let's just use the word homeless. I haven't got a home, mm. therefore I'm homeless. Yeah. Neither of these other people have got a home. The, there are no levels of that. Surely there can't be levels. Of, okay, maybe a young woman is more vulnerable than a young man. Yeah. So, But in general, how, you, but I suppose they do. That's it. I mean, we have this thing in this country about the social services without realizing that, they have to make really difficult choices. Yeah, yeah. It's like triage in a hospital. Yeah, yeah you both bleed in, but your cut's a bit deeper. So I'm sorry, you're next. You got yeah, you got wait. You know, but mine mine was a was an odd thing because I've I'm a great believer that one of the one of the things in society in 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 maybe it's English. I don't know enough about other cultures. But, uh, but particularly in the English society, in English society, is the the strength and the power and the importance and the effect of embarrassment. Okay? Yeah, I think that I know I know people who are dead because they were too embarrassed to talk about things that were yeah. wrong with them. You know, later on we found out, my God, if they, why didn't they do something about that? because they were embarrassed, okay? Uh, and my homelessness, which I'm going to call it because we're on that podcast, came about because my uh, parents had broken up. And my, my, you know, I come sort of stepfather, stepfamilies. I was never, it was never that. It was all right. It was fine. We weren't, you know, we were nothing like yours. But, but my parents had broken up. And I'd been away from home. I left home. I joined the Navy, actually, the Merchant Navy, not the proper one. Uh, that's, a, that's a joke, by the way. All oh, right, okay. If you're, if you're in the Merchant Navy, it's a fantastic <laughs> group. But it didn't suit me, and I joined and then left quite quickly. And when I got back to my hometown, I, my parents had split up because I realised that they would basically, me leaving home gave yeah. them the opportunity. to. So, so it was a difficult situation. But I come from quite a quite a posh place, really. Uh, you know, I come from up north, but not up north, gritty like that. Where are you from? I'm from Chester, which is right. a, a very pretty yeah, old yeah. Roman town. Yeah. And so the situation I found myself in was 
I had nowhere to stay, you know. Yeah. It's as, as simple as that. But where I live, uh, fortunately, it was about August. So the weather was still quite nice. And the, the, the Chester's got a beautiful river that runs through it. Yeah. And there are boats that go up and down the river, various types of sort of cruises and you know you pay and you get on them and the tourist boats and there would there used to be there's not uh it's not there anymore i've no it's, it's been turned into something else now but there used to be a massive boathouse where the boats were kept during yeah. the winter they were taken in there or they were put in there if they were having repairs and there was always a few boats in there and i broke in uh so just knocked a couple of uh, wooden slats out the back and got in there and so i was sleeping on a boat yeah inside a shed yeah so i i wasn't actually on the streets i was quite no, comfy you, it was quite do, warm do you know what i've um even though i was home i've said this before i've never slept in a shop doorway or anything when i and i say that i slept on the streets i always broke in because i was a thief anyway and that was my thing i used to burgle shops yeah i would always find somewhere to break in Exactly like that and sleep. So I, I, even though I say that I slept rough, I never, not like my friend on the first podcast, he slept outside, yeah. you know, like you, you, a street dweller kind of thing. Um, I never did that. I was always the same. I always found somewhere to break into and make comfortable. And there was a couple of places I've slept where in a third world country that would have been considered yes. as a decent abode. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And people would have lived there for their entire lives. Yeah. Well, so, these boats, well, I'll I, I tell you, I, I'm getting the months wrong here because it would have been every march it was about april because it was april may june july august there were about these five months and it was it wasn't cold so i was never cold uh if it ever rained it never bothered me because i was inside i was in a boat you know and, and i was lying and it was quite comfy and i used to get up uh make my i, I would wake up because i knew that people came to the boatyard to work at about eight in the morning. So I was always up at about seven and out and, and just, it's amazing what you can, what you can do because I used to just go and sit in the park and then go to the library. And for the first couple of months, I'd go and see people pop around their house and have a cup of tea. And then after a while I stopped doing that because I was getting not, trampy but a little bit you know yeah like a big coat that i used to wear so I, I stopped doing that but i i never broke into a shop but what i used to <laughs> there was a fruit and veg a florist yeah that, that had flowers and fruit and veg yeah and they had a yard right and the yard had a big gate it was a big a tall gate but it didn't reach the ground it was about a foot off the ground yeah and i was much smaller then yeah and i used to slide underneath it and i used to go in there and steal i guess that's the word i'm trying to avoid but steal but fruit and so i lived on apples and pears and grapes and things like that and yeah. i remember ridiculously Sometimes if they were doing bouquets, they would have some of them outside that they were would steal flowers and and then give them to people <laughs> the next. Um, I don't know. I don't, do, I don't you know, know do you know what the second podcast I did uh, with Earl um, was called Places We Slept? And a, do you know Slough at all? Yeah, I do. So Wexham Park Road, I think it is. Um, there was a florist and I used to go around the back so there was a shop front and then round the back was all of their, their sort of, this florist had a port cabin that was against the fence and the gap was so big. But at that point, mm. I was like seven stone or something. And yeah. I just sort of slide along and open this window and climb into this port cabin where they stored all their flowers on the night time. And it was heated because all their flowers were in there. Yeah. It smelled lovely. Uh, I slept in there for about four months, you know, and the same thing. I just get up in the morning and get out before. It, so I slept in there for four months. Nobody would ever have known that I was there. No. I've been coming to work. And opening up and leaving, you know, as planned. And nobody would ever have known that every night there was this skinny little thing <laughs> climbing through their window and crashing out. So I know. Yeah. And it's and it is that kind of life. So do you know what? You're right there. The the thing is the streets. I never I never slept on the streets. I never no. slept. I, I remember once sleeping at the at the railway station 
for some reason. And yeah. just, maybe it was just because I was there and I couldn't be bothered walking all the way back to the river. So I, uh, and, and, and then it ended. And the way it ended is um, it's a story that my children sometimes, if we're all sitting around and we're all together one night, they'll say, if they've had a drink, because they're grown up, my children. Yeah. I say, come on, Dad, tell us about, tell us what happened. I I came to London because I thought London's an amazing place. I've seen it on the television and the streets, people there. Streets you know. are paved with gold. Well, not not just that they're paved with gold, but here's something else people don't don't quite understand because we're talking now about the 1970s. This is yeah. happened to me in the 1970s, and. Whereas no one would have really bothered if they knew that a, a boy of like, I would have been 15, 16, was, was sleeping rough in a boat. What they couldn't ever get over the fact was that a boy of 15, 16 was walking around the streets during the day. Yeah. Because they said, well, hey, have you finished school? You have left school. Why aren't you working? The people very often would say to me, oh, you're not working today. And I'd say, no, nah, we're having a day off or we're stock taking. I don't know why I thought I would work somewhere where stock needed to be taken. but <laughs> Midweek. Was, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it became that one of the real problems for me became people questioning me during, during the day. Strangers would come up to me. You're not working, boy. You know, because it was it was frowned upon back in the 70s. So yeah. I moved to London uh, because I knew that London was a place where people didn't bother you. You, you know, there was a, so many people, no one was going to worry about one more. And I, I spent the last two weeks of my career, uh, homeless career, in a, in a bus, sh- in, in not a bus shelter, I'm sorry, in Victoria Coach Station. Yeah, I know Victoria. Because that was well. yeah. Victoria Coach Station then was vibrant and alive. Now it's you can't get in, the barriers are down. No, but no, then no. I think the last coach was was something like 135, and the first coach was six o'clock. So there was always people there. People and there were people with, with rucksacks sleeping on benches because they were, you know, they were traveling on yeah. coaches, they were waiting for their coach, and it was legitimate. And I was there for two weeks. And at the end of the second week, two blokes walked up to me and said, uh, are you homeless? And I said, what? You stupid. I'm waiting for my coach. I'm going to uh, Gillingham <laughs> to see to see my girlfriend. And they said, no, you know, we've been watching you for a few nights now. You're, you're homeless, aren't you? I said, well, why? What's it, what's it to you? I tried to be aggressive. And they said, listen, we've got a house in Fulham Palace Road and we let young lads stay there, people like yourself, uh, for, to get themselves back on their feet. And because I hadn't, didn't have the brains I were born with, I said, oh, yeah, brilliant, thanks. And picked up my carrier bag and went with them. At which point my kids then start laughing and say, so come on, tell us about the gang rape. <laughs> and I was like, no. Strangely enough, they were perfectly genuine Christian mm-hmm. gentlemen who did have a house in Fulham Palace Road, Harwood Road, I'll never forget them. And they had about seven or eight bedrooms. And the deal was you got a bed, you got your little room, your own room, you got a bed, and they gave you breakfast in the morning. And then you had to go out and find a job. Okay. And they gave you six weeks. And during about the third or fourth week, I found a job, got the job. One of the people at the place I was working with had a spare room in a shared house, which I'd never come across before, but okay, fine. And it was like three quid a week. And then I was back and I became part of society again. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's good people out there, you know. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a really weird thing, and it's like I never did anything. I never went back and thanked them or anything, or never. I don't, you're not aware at the time that something is a big thing that's yeah, happening. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it's from that point that I then, be, you know, started a whole new life as as a whole new person, basically. Yeah, I always sort of point out to people that. Because, you know, a lot of people are very, very unsympathetic towards some homeless people. And a lot of people, what I don't like is when people say, well, 
if I was in that situation, I would do this or I would do yeah. that. Because it's like, well, you don't know what you do for stars. No. And also, and this idea that you can just get out of it all on your own. I mean, some people do. Uh, you know, and people sort of point to me as though I did everything on my own. And, I, you know, I got so much help time and time again and often messed it up. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And sort of because I... Because I was homeless for so young, I think this is a big problem as well. Most young, most homeless people are young people, yeah. and most young homeless people have come from terrible backgrounds where they haven't been taught how to function as human beings. So it's really hard to get them to break out of that cycle. Because I mean, I got, you know, I've got given places to live at seventeen, and it just, you know, within four weeks, I'd just be in an empty flat with a light bulb and a mattress, and I'd just abandon it, you know, and. It sounds like I just threw that chance away, which I did, but it was because I just, I wasn't prepared. Nobody sort of, yeah. I needed that extra bit of help, which eventually I started getting. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm fine now, absolutely fine. But yeah, well, I definitely- You've got a Welsh dresser, mate. You've got a Welsh dresser. Crown, you've I'm middle class. I've got a Welsh dresser. <laughs> I've got a boxing trophy. So <laughs> I'm doing all right. But um, it took a lot of help. It took a lot of help. It took a lot of, um, a lot of attempts as well. So- I know it's a funny thing, the homeless situation now, because I feel I, I, I don't associate myself at all what I went through with, with what you see on the streets when you see people and you think, no, they're, they're in real trouble. Yeah. You know, I, I always think of my, when I look back on it, it's, it's not with a fondness, but it's, it was like a little adventure that. I yeah. Had. We, we get asked, we did a thing where we just ask us any questions. And one of the questions that came up to me and my friend, are, and bear in mind, he was homeless for 20 years. Yeah. And, you know, he was in a, he was as bad as it gets. He was injecting heroin into his groin and all sorts. Like, you know, he was as homeless drug addicts as you can find. And they asked like, do you ever miss it? And the answer every time is, yeah, yeah, there are sometimes there's aspects like when you were talking about on the boat, there was times in the summer where, you know, me and a few other people were homeless together and we were sleeping in Windsor, um, you know, Windsor Park down on the canals next to the boats. We were robbing a few of the boats as well, um, mm. but a very sort of a ve I've never been freer. I know that there's points okay, yeah. when, when, when the weather was good, you know, when the weather was nice and we weren't cold on a nighttime and we were sleeping outside and I've never, ever been that free again um mm. you know there was no response. there was times where you know i wasn't signing i just didn't exist i wasn't signing on i wasn't getting benefits all of our money came from whatever it was we were doing to get money uh no rules you know so there are times that i miss that freedom i wouldn't do it again <laughs> no that's a, that's an important thing though not existed yeah because yeah, again, I would never, I don't look back on, with any fondness, but when you th when you think about it, there is that thing that you think, I'm watching the whole of the rest of the world here and I have no connection with it. Hence, yeah, hence the, the, the name that we came up with for these podcasts from the outside looking in was yeah. just, when I was at my, it really was like I was on the outside of society looking in and I had no part of it. It wasn't, wasn't part of my life. You know, I was, uh, once you get into that homeless community and it is a community, um, you know, it's a it's a separate entity from the rest of from the rest of your mainstream society. So I still see it. I can still pick up on it when I go into a new town. I can see the people that are part of a community that everybody judges, but they're still part of a community. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're, they and there is honour amongst them kind of thing. I mean, they rip each other off quite a bit, but they also look after each other. I know numerous people that if I had nowhere to sleep, would be like, "Well, I'm going to sleep outside with you. I'm not just going to let you do it on your own kind of thing." So. There is a sort of togetherness about it, but I, you know, I miss aspects of it. I wouldn't do it again. I wouldn't do it for choice. I know that. I don't, you know, when I see people ask me sometimes where I want to take part in these sleep outs. No, I got asked to do one of them. I got asked to do a celebrity sleep out. Nah. And I thought, nah. if you knew how insulting that would yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. I just, can I you just... imagine, can you imagine being homeless and thinking, that's my sp mate you're in my space <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i i get why people do it but i think it raises money it raises awareness i think some people i don't know whether, i think the sort of where the more well off that they get that take part i think are they doing it to say oh wow this is what it must feel like to be homeless you're doing it for one night knowing yeah. that knowing that it's over tomorrow you're camping yeah. out you're camping out in the cold yeah, that's what you do no yeah. it's not you're camping it's not like, in june in june in june yeah, yeah. We, oh, we, no, listen we, let me ask yeah. you this rick so yeah. this is something that that still comes up a lot what it was to do and it never affected me because I never sort of 
because I didn't want people to know I was homeless, so I never sort of begged for money or asked for money. I never had no part in that. Yeah. Uh, I used to, funny enough, used to find quite a lot of money. But um, what's the deal with homeless people and, and money? Because my instinct is still always give them a fiver. I will, will, will always. I get, yeah, a friend of mine messaged me not long ago asking whether it was the right thing to do because she didn't know whether she'd done the right thing by giving this homeless person some money, worried that it was going to go on drugs. And I was like, it probably is going to go on some yeah. drugs and it's probably going to feed them, you know, yeah. and it's going to help them out. I just always say it's up to it's up to you. I um I usually if I see somebody outside of a shop, I usually go and buy them four cans and something to eat rather than give them money because I know the money probably will go on hard, hard drugs. I, I also know that being sober when you're homeless, it's almost impossible. And if I was homeless again tomorrow, I wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't mm. do it. I wouldn't do it sober. Do you know what I mean? So people criticize people for not doing it sober. I wouldn't do it sober. You've got to do something to get through that. No, you know it's, I mean? it's a weird thing because I, I, I had this conversation with someone who said, uh, oh, some bloke tried to rip me off today. I said, oh, it's but near where I work in London Bridge. And they said, oh, he said he needed £28, very specific amount of money needed it for a shelter. Uh, but I happen to know that the shelters don't actually charge at all. And that's it. Or he just wants to. And I was like, oh, sorry, you think the guy's ripping you off? <laughs> He's sitting in a doorway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, whether he needs the money, just give, give the guy some money because... It, he, you're right. He will eat some of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah you and know, and it, if you want, if you want, sit. Just don't sit because that's more. But just you go down and say, "Listen, you do me a favor. Will you, will you make me a promise? Will you make sure you get yourself a burger first? Yeah. You know, if even if you just do that, do that. But don't. People when they get self righteous say, yeah. "No, I, I won't," because you know why? Goes on drink. Goes on drinking drugs. Well, yeah, it goes on drinking drugs. You go. So I make it. I make a point of not yeah. because I don't want them. I'm helping them by not giving them money. You're really not. Yeah, You're and not. just that same thing. I just when people judge them. Oh well, I know that they just spend it on drinking drugs. Well, yeah, I would as well. Yeah, <laughs> Do you know yeah. What I, mean? I don't think 100%. you should get your wages because I think you're just going to spend it on clothes. <laughs> yeah, and rent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's. it's <laughs> what's weird is I I I sold the big issue for a bit. I did beg at one point. I sold the big issue for a bit and I met a beggar called Titch, his name was He's probably dead now, to be fair. Um, but I was selling the big issue and I'd be out if five, six hours. I'd make like 20 quid. And one day he just said, put your big issue away and just say, have you got any spare change? And I did it. And I made 30 quid in an hour. Uh. And I was like, what? And he was making in excess of a hundred pound a day begging. Um, but, you know, I think people worry that then he's going to, Got any, you know, you hear this thing, oh, they they're funding themselves living in a three bedroom house, blah blah blah. Yeah. They go and get showered, and actually, they were to do. I mean, he was a, a, you know, as heroin addicted as it gets, and it was going on drugs, etc. Yeah. But it's just that, yeah, you know, I went from my mate sold the big issue, and a big issue gets a bad rep. Um, you know, again, people seem to think that that's begging. The big issue, he has to front the money up himself to go and buy these magazines, and then he has to stand outside all day long selling them for more than what he bought them to make some money. And to me, I'm like, that's just, that's business, isn't it? Do you mm, know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's yeah. that's as, as simple as business gets. He's buying something and selling it on. So what's, why are people annoyed by seeing a big issue vendor? So my, yeah, my, my advice is always the same. If you want to give money to people, give them money. If you don't want to, don't give them money, but don't bang on about it. Just don't give them money. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't get all righteous about the fact that you're not giving somebody. Yeah, I did him a favour. He won't know it, but he'll, he'll, th he'll thank me for he'll that. He'll thank me in years to come. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Tomorrow, when he's not on drugs anymore, yes. he'll thank me. Yeah, did you, what about drinking drugs for you when you was home? No, no, I'm, no just, again. Are you a drinker or have you ever? No, sort of I've, never, like... I've never, ever been a drinker. Um, yeah. This is weird because you have to have, make this kind of proviso certainly in, in, in the world that I live in now the, the world of show business if people say uh, do you want to drink do you drink do you want to drink say no 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 so I'll just have a coke uh, yeah and then, are you in recovery <laughs> <laughs> no I, I just uh, don't I don't particularly drink so I, you know what so I'll have a glass of wine with you if we're having some dinner or something like that yeah. I don't like a taste of beer oh right okay uh, and I'm not really 
bothered to you know i love a cup of tea i love a cup of tea <laughs> right no i am in recovery but i don't need to explain. i think when i tell people i don't drink they assume i'm a muslim so they don't question it too oh much. yeah so I get away so with you, it. Do you know what I mean? you've got that card <laughs> yeah i just I pull uh, out, the, the I pull reason card. I'm, I'm very lucky that i don't drink because i work uh, i do you know i do bits of telly and bits of radio but my 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 99% of my working life I've been a, a, a stand up comic. Yeah. And that is a weird job because I can't think of any other job where you would get in your car in London and drive to Birmingham or Sheffield or York or somewhere like that and get out of your car and walk into your place of work and the first question you asked is like what what do you want to drink? What do you want to drink? And you go in the dressing room and they always have the 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 ice bucket full of beers. Right. And it's like, well, hang on. You know, I'm driven here from London. You must know I'm driving home again. Yeah. And um, to walk into a, into a comedy club and say, is anyone, is there any chance of a cup of tea? They look at you like, it's not a transport cafe, mate. No, of course we haven't got tea. We've got as much beer as you want. And it's like, and so that's sort of a weird thing. But I've also, over the 30 years I've been doing it, I have seen some of the real tragedy that, uh, of, of drink. I've seen some of the most talented people. Yeah. Destroy themselves, literally destroy themselves. Um, so I mean, three, three of them are dead. Yeah. Uh, but people that, when I first met them, were sharp and had these brains that were like... And then two or three years later, you meet them and you're working with them and you think, oh, this is shit. You're just talking. Yeah. And you're leaving gaps where you think the laughter should be. And maybe you're even hearing it. I'm telling you, it's not there. I just, you know, I've, I've done every, you know, I've done all the drugs. <laughs> I've done them all. Do you know what I mean? I've, you know, I've had problems with quite a lot of them from early age. Um, you know, solvents from 13 kind of thing progressing into heroin and crack drink is the one that brought me to my knees like so i've been sober just gone 10 months it took me four or five years to finally crack it out of everything out there drink is the one that took really you know such a massive effort to stop drinking and is that is that because ricky is that because it's socially acceptable i think so i think that's a big part of it i mean i've always been because of my background, like I've sort of done some reading in it and, you know, the addictive personality, I don't think that's a real thing, but the whole um, instant gratification kind of thing. So when you've grown up and you've not had a nice childhood and you find this thing that you just do that makes you feel great straight away, as in alcohol and drugs, it's very easy to just keep doing it. And then it becomes a habit. And, you know, and then like you said, when I joined the Navy, a lot of my previous habits stopped. So, I mean, I'll beat everybody. Before I joined the Navy, I, I was more of a weed smoker, probably too much, but I was still more yeah. of a weed smoker. When I joined the military, that all had to stop, which was great. But then I replaced it with the so which I'd all, I've always had an unhealthy relationship with alcohol, but I sort of went full time on the alcohol because that's the one that I'm allowed to do. And you know, I read the, you know, I think it was Tyson Fury said like if if alcohol was invented now in a country where it hadn't been present it would be illegal yeah. instantly. Oh, good God, yeah. instantly. Like you look at the damage it does to people and society in general, but it's part of our culture. So that's, that's why there's so many people with a problem. But yeah, out of them all, out of everything I've ever took, I would say that drink is the most destructive for me personally. That was the one that I found it impossible to quit, um, you know, to the point where it took, me, it took me four or five years to finally get to a place where I, I don't feel like I'm depriving myself of anything. I'm happy. I, I'm in a much yeah, better Yeah, it mood. is. It's, it's an incredible point, that, because it is. I mean, I know people, again, because of this business, I know people who, who, who do cocaine. Yeah. And uh, this, we, everyone's done a bit of weed when they're yeah. growing up. Yeah. And, you know, I know places, I've been in houses and I've lived in town where people say, we have a joint. Yeah, that's fine. And I know certain places where people go and you know the, it's not unusual for someone to take cocaine in that sort of society well coke's but right in, now so yeah but in general mm. i mean there there are no there are no places really where you can say right uh yeah dragging anyone so we're gonna chase the drag we, we're gonna have a bit <laughs> of heroin we're gonna, that, that doesn't exist yeah. and yet 
drink, you know, drinking alcohol is a drug. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And and to have to, to live in a society which we do, where it's you're thought sometimes to be a bit of a oh, is he coming? He's all right, but he doesn't drink. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a nuisance, isn't he? He's always a bit serious. Wants to talk about, and it's it is it is weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's strange. It is very strange. But what I don't, it's not strange that we. It's strange that we're not allowed to do all the other stuff. Do you know what I mean? But we are allowed to drink. <laughs> that's what that's what I've never really understood. Like it's like if you're gonna let one go, but especially weed. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. if, and I think everybody sort of more people than than not will say, well, there's not really anything that bad about a bit of weed. But it's illegal, you know. You can't do it. Yeah, I'd get, I'd get sacked. I would get thrown out of the navy if I yeah. smoked weed. Um, you know, but I can. But I can, alcohol, I, I can drink. I know I've done, I've done gigs in the navy, yeah, and it yeah. is. It's a, it's a boozy culture of forces, isn't it? It's, it's a lot different. It's starting to change, but in general, all the food, all the forces is a, a boozy, boozy culture. Um, oh my god, it's, it's just unbelievable. <laughs> I've, I've never felt as out of place as when I've, <laughs> I've if, if uh, you go do gigs when when you know they're alongside or yeah. the military gigs and you do them and you say no i've driven here and i'm dri- driving home no can i just get a coke and it's like i think the comic's gay <laughs> yeah yeah somebody's turned up <laughs> somebody's turned up the comic isn't a comic i don't know what's going on here is it just turn up yeah yes yeah, it's, it's a boozy boozy <laughs> yeah. culture and i mean it's, it's it is it's starting to change now, but for a while there, um, as long as you turn up in the morning and you've shaved and your clothes have been ironed, yeah, and you look presentable enough, if you're still hanging out a bit, it's a case of just get rid of him for a little bit until he's sobered up, and then you know crack on. Yeah, if somebody failed a drugs test because they smoked a joint three weeks before, kicked out, they're in on the spot, yeah. zero tolerance. But that's just a societal thing. So who knows? I, I know the, the, the boozy culture, I think I can only say what I see in the Navy. It's starting to change. The young lads that come in now, you know, we pull in somewhere, um, we dock in and, you know, myself and my one of my best friends, we, we, you know, go out, get smashed, come back, sneaking booze onto the ship because you're not really supposed to take your own booze on, but we'd be sneaking things on. The young lads just coming on with protein. That's it. You know, oh, just wow. bags and bags of protein and all they do is go to the gym, go to the gym, go to the gym, watch box sets. You know, uh, live a far healthier lifestyle. So I, yeah. think, I think the culture's going. There's talk that they're going to phase out the drinking at sea element, um, which even the drinkers amongst us are starting to say it's probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. What with the guns and well, stuff? We, we had, to, I was out when I first joined up. We did a deployment out in the Middle East and some Americans came over to our ship and um, they came over from their aircraft carrier and they stayed on our ship for three weeks. And they, we'd met them before in uh, Bahrain and we were explaining that we had bars on our ship. We had a bar on our ship, you know, actual, an actual pub on the ship. Mm. And they thought we were joking. And then when they came on, they still thought we was winding them up and we were like, go on and take us to this bar. And we were like, all right. And then we went down and we took them into the ship's bar and they were just flabbergasted because they're not allowed to drink. And they were just, they yeah. were taking pictures of it or they couldn't believe it. And then we all got absolutely smashed. And they just couldn't <laughs> believe that that had to put them. We all got up in the morning. We was all at work. We was there. And they were just, they were saying it was a different world. So, but yeah, I think, I think things are changing. I think. It, but it is a weird thing. When I used to do the, we, I used to do deep decompression gigs. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the, the rule, uh, first of all, when, it, when they first started, drink was just, yeah, fine, whatever you want. And then they realized, no, hang on, this is part of the problem. The yeah. decompression problem. And so they used to issue them vouchers. You could have four drinks. Yeah. But the first, the first thing that any decompression party do when they arrived was someone would set up the right uh, tickets. Who wants? Who's got tickets? Yeah. How many do you want? Two. I get you two. And it was and and people were trading tickets and yeah, and, and, yeah, and these um... these vouchers became currency. And you'd see people walking around with. 30 of them like that but a good day but a good day a day yeah well our rule our rule is that we're only entitled to two cans of beer a day in the royal navy 
because I'm still serving and I don't want to get myself into trouble, I won't explain how there's ways around that. But, <laughs> but there, there is, <laughs> you know. But yeah, I, do, I think that it's going to get phased out. I think more people are sort of coming on board with the idea that it's, it's probably for the best not having... Yeah, yeah. Uh, not having an aircraft carrier with millions <coughs> and millions, billions of pounds worth of equipment and drunk <laughs> people like me stumbling about the ship. Um, anyway, I think, you know, I think we've sort of managed to do a podcast there. Um, oh, how, how, what time is it? I don't know. I've got a, I've, it's 11 o'clock. I know you've got to go to work. Uh, the, the only thing that I did want to lead on to before go on, go on, then do, go. do win, lose, or draw. <laughs> I love go that on. program. When bring it back, how do nah. you bring it back? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what you've done there, Rick. Yeah, you've done what well, one of the things that I love. Um, that uh, I've got relatives that do it like my, my wife's side of the family because i've still got my family and i'm very they're still up north and i love them dearly and i see them three or four times a year but my main family you know is my wife's family i'm married into my wife's family and uh they're lovely people they're they're, they're, they're turkish <clears throat> and so the rule is they don't have son-in-laws right if you marry their daughter you become their son that's yeah. it yeah that's it and so i'm part of that family now and they very <laughs> I would say, Bob, so I was going to say to you, you know that program you used to do, win, lose, or draw, draw, yeah. you should do that again. <laughs> okay. It, yeah. Let me explain how the world of television works. <laughs> <laughs> you don't just turn up. You don't just say, well, we're, no. we're going to do that again. My Uncle Remy said, I'm doing this now. Did he not phone you? Uh, no, they did it. They, they, were, they were so much. I had a lovely life. Ricky, yeah. honestly, I uh, with VH1, which was the, the music thing, Windows were drawing bed with dinner, and then I, I did think all the show. I had about 12 I remember, years. I, I remember the show. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it was good. I had about 12 years where I was working regular, yeah. and it was, and that's a that's a long span. Well, wasn't the show where you would show the behind the scenes yeah. of putting yeah. together a chat show as well as, yeah, uh, it, it, we had it was, it was. Brand new. No one had ever done anything like it at all. Yeah. We said, right, we're going to do a chat show, but we're going to film everything. Yeah. So Monday morning, we had people working. We were working on putting a chat show. We did a chat show. We're going to do it Friday night, and it'll go out on Saturday. But all the time, they just invented the mini cam. And we right. had two guys filming everything. Every meeting they were there, every, every walking down corridors, they were following you, everything. You didn't even notice them in the end. And then on Friday night, sorry, yeah, Friday night, Thursday night, sorry, we'd make, we'd do the chat show in the big studio, London weekend, we'd do the chat show. Here's the guests that there, there. And then all the next 48 hours, we would spend editing the bits that we would, the chat show with the bits that we'd filmed. Yeah. And it, it, it when it worked, it was the best thing I've ever done because it was real, it was genuine, it wasn't made up. Uh, and when it worked, it had it had my fav one of my favorite bits in it, which was um, a meeting where somebody said, "Great news, Quentin Tarantino is coming over. He's coming over. He's only in London for a couple of days, but he's uh, I'm pretty sure he's gonna, his people have said, yeah, he'd, he'd love to do the show. We're going to have him do the show." Uh, I was so excited. And then the next meeting was Quentin's. We're not sure that Quentin's going to be free, but um, and then there was some other famous director. He's in as well. So can we just Quentin's? Yes, yes, Quentin. But just in case we put this other guy here, if not him, we'll have him. And then it cuts to the night of the show and me standing there. <sighs> So I said, you all right, Bill? So said, yeah, yeah, fine. You up for it? Yeah, I'm up for it. I'm just, I'm just sitting here thinking, how the fuck have we gone from Quentin Tarantino to fucking Michael Winner? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that is a big jump. I remember, I only remember one thing about it because I just remember how 
it was so honest, if you like, because there was, I can't remember who it was. I'm sure it was a pair of footballers' wives had decided to do a pop song. Yeah, yeah. But there was some kind of scandal with one of their husbands and you were behind the scenes saying, don't worry, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about that. And one of the wives said, they're going to talk about that. I'm not doing it. And the other said, yeah, come on. And then you went out and you just talked about it. And I thought, well, at least actually you're showing yeah. how it all works. Like, you yeah, know, that is that's TV. That that's how it goes. Like, you know, so. yeah. we had a Michael Jackson in, uh, impression. It's a really brilliant Michael Jackson. We got him. We said, we want you to do something. So, and he said, yeah, yeah. We give him he, he, his fee was hundred quid or something. So we said, yeah, fine. And then we said, right, what we're going to do is we're going to meet me and Vinny are going to be doing a, a thing about films. So let's look at the big films that are coming out. And one of them is ransom with Mel Gibson about um, somebody who kidnaps a, a 10 year old child. Mel Gibson's child gets yeah, kidnapped. Yeah, yeah. I know the film. Yeah, I know the film. Uh, and, and I said, so um, it seems a bit far fetched, though. I mean, who'd want to kidnap a 10 year old child? And at that point, the Michael Jackson, we want you to just walk across behind us like that. And that would that be. And the guy said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a great friend of Michael's. And I go, well, no, you're not. You just make he, money out of him. He, does, he doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know you exist. <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry. I feel I couldn't uh, do yeah, that. And he nah, walked out as well. Yeah. Uh, the Michael Jackson years. But, <laughs> but going back to this, most people only get a couple of years in television. And I had, I had about 10. Now. The other stuff I did, I did a bit of writing and that. But honest to God, People say, oh, you should do this. And I'm really flattered when they say it, but it's not ever going to It was, happen. you know what, it's because I was expelled from school. So win, lose, or draw was, was a big part. Of, <laughs> was, it was a big part of my life when I was growing up because I was expelled <laughs> from school by 14. Um, so, you know, daytime TV is what I grew up on. Um, yeah. And win, lose, or draw was, was it because it was on every day, wasn't it? Was it on every day? It was on every, it was on every five day? days a week. Five yeah. days a week. And just five days a week. And for... you look back, I was looking back in just all the names, all the comedians. All the oh, names used to go on fantastic it. Fantastic people on it. Well, Johnny Vegas was on it as, yeah. a, as a, a not as a Johnny Vegas, but as Michael Pennington. He was a contestant on it, right? Before he even became Johnny Vegas, right? So, no, uh, but I it it was lovely, and but then you've had enough, and then it's yeah. somebody else's turn. What's better, TV or radio? Ah, oh, radio. Yeah, I think Talksport. I think Talksport in my dream world. Me and my mates are talking about this. We're a talk sport presenter. That's got to be the best job in the world, isn't it? I know you do talk radio now, but we were I know, like, but no, when I did talk, I did talk yeah. for seven years. Like just talking is. about sport yeah. on the radio all day. That's got to be. Yeah. That's got to be. And you know what you do? You, you try and make it sound more difficult. Yeah. The, the, they've told you, what's, what station do you work for? Talk sport. So what do you do? Well, we look at some really sensitive issues. <laughs> no, no, no. no, you don't. You talk about sport. Talk about sport. Yeah, give me yeah, boxing and football show. Be sorted. I've I've sat next to Dillian White. Yeah. I've sat next He's to hilarious. Deontay yeah. Wilder. Right. He came in wonder. Yeah. You know, and I've I've got no right to be in the same city as these. No, people. no, yeah. But I've chatted with them. I've asked them questions. Yeah. You know, that's a ridiculous thing. My mate I was Ro once I, 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 right. Sorry, I I was once people. I realised on the tube that people were looking at me because I was sitting there and I was smiling and laughing to myself. I weren't reading anything. I wasn't. I didn't have headphones. And they looked at me and I thought, oh, sorry, it's got serious again. And the reason I was suddenly started laughing is because I'd realised that I'd, that morning I'd spent twenty minutes talking about England's midfield and how England midfield should operate. Yeah. To Ray Wilkins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, that's how ridiculous the world is that a prat like me can have these conversations. I've met them all, mate. Yeah. I've met them all. That and would it's be amazing. Just... Talk radio now. That's gone sort of, that's like a TV show now. <clears throat> yeah. That's when you said what's best TV or radio. And I said radio. That's because he, you know, you can get as fat as you want and your air can look as bad as it is. It don't matter. But now, of course, everything's filmed. It, everything's yeah. filmed. Streaming it, yeah. Yeah, stream it online. And I don't like that because I've done telly and I've done wireless and the money should be a lot more. <laughs> Once they turn a the camera on, there should be a lot more money <laughs> yeah. involved. Yeah. But So I, I, like I now have to wear... I have to think what I'm going to wear. Right, whereas you didn't before. Yeah. Oh, God. 
back in the early days of, of, of radio, people when I used to work on GLR, you'd turn up in slippers. Yeah. It didn't matter. You you could literally turn up in, in anything. It didn't matter what you were because you were on the wireless. Yeah. yeah so I'm you just this. said... I'm naked. Yeah. I'm naked. Yeah. Waist down. Yeah. Waist down, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I've just, I've just been... In, in, well... I came to London because I didn't have anywhere to live in Chester, and I, the the two Christian guys gave me a room in a house and didn't kill me. Yeah, and it's from there, out. and from there, I've been on television and written a film and done all stuff like that. What film? I, I wrote a film. I wrote a film called Pierpoint, mm. which was about Albert Pierpoint. It was the last, the UK's last execution, a hangman. Oh right, yeah, hangman. yeah. Uh, so you know. All of it completely and utterly by chance. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I've, I've winged my life. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Know? I've winged totally it. winged it, you know, and now I've got you in front of me. But maybe know, got... because of the background you had and to a much lesser extent things that happened to me, you're more, you're kind of more aware of what you're doing. You're more grateful for what you're doing because you think, and you take it a lot less seriously. I'm not, I know you take your job very seriously, but you do sit and think, I know, but there are days that you just sit and think, I shouldn't be here. Oh, yeah, all the time. I mean, I don't take my job very seriously. I'm leaving my job in April. I leave after 12 and a half years. Yeah, what, but what while, the, you've, while you've been doing it, you've been taking it seriously. Well, well, one of the bad, one of the things that gets thrown in my direction is that I don't take the job very seriously. But I think part of that is because I just, I find, I find taking life seriously very hard yeah. because... I'm constantly sort of thinking, you know, a lot of my friends from back then are still in a mess. You know, yeah. they've, they, you know, they, I, I'm, I, at first I was sort of uncomfortable when people would be saying to me, oh, you've done so well with yourself. I was sort of uncomfortable about it thinking, well, I haven't done that much, but now I'm looking and out of everybody that I grew up with that was homeless um, and had all those drug problems, there's only, I can only think of three or four of us out of a lot of people that have progressed yeah. You know, really progress through life to got to a point where I've got a Welsh dresser behind me. Yeah. And that which is the mark, class. basically. If you, yeah. And the Welsh little dresser. string, are they little little padded elephants, the string down the side of the Welsh dresser? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my wife's Indian. So yeah. she likes anything. Yeah. Elephant, I thought they would be. Like, I thought know, they would be. So, you know, got that. And the boxing trophy and the, the little. Union and the Jack Union thing. Jack, of course, proudly. Yeah. Yeah, Pencil well, case, it's a union yeah. flag. It's only a union jack if it's at sea. I don't there know. There you go. You see. So, there you go. Yeah. So yeah, I'm doing a writing life, and it was. Um, I like to talk to people. So <laughs> that's, yeah, that's my but, thing. You know, well, it may be you see that the terrible things that happen to you, and the the weird things that happen to me, what they give you is a sense of perspective. Yeah. Now, I know a lot of people who went to media, who went to did really well at school and then went to uni and then did a media degree and now they're working in the radio, working in television. And you, you think you don't know anything else though apart from this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe you should have had a couple of years not living rough, but just, you know, not doing anything, mooching about. And, yeah. I mean, and then it, cause I, you know, the military's a bubble. So, We've sort of, I understand why a lot of people, when they leave the military, if they've joined first thing from school and then they've done their whole life in the military, I see the panic when it's time for them to leave because they don't know anything else. Uh, and there is part of me that thinks maybe, maybe you shouldn't, shouldn't join until you're sort of 21 and you've had a job and you know, you, you've paid bills yourself. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And you, you, you understand what normal civilian life's about. Because I see a lot of them fall by the wayside, you know, and they're really panicking as it's time to go because, you know, the military's hard in some aspects, but it's very easy in a lot of other aspects. Yeah, you, you looked know, after. I, you but, looked after. I, my job is to turn up on time wearing the right clothes. That is my job. From there, I just do what people tell me to do. And any medical issues are sorted out on my base. Any housing issues, sort. I don't, I haven't paid rent. It can't, I pay rent, but it comes out of my wages. I don't see anything. I just go to work every morning and finish and come home. And that's it. That's my job. That's my life. It's very easy. Well, here's a weird thing, because I've come across that in the last seven years. Yeah. Ex-footballers. Yeah. Right? He won't mind me telling you this. The, the, the one I'm friendly with, because I don't, these people... I find it very difficult. I don't mix because I don't socialize because I don't drink. And I yeah. like to I like to just deal with them at work and then, you know, yeah. 
But Perry Groves, the ex-Arsenal player, has, has become a pal of mine. He's a, he's, a, he's a nice bloke. And he tells the story of going on holiday after he left the uh, finished playing. He went on holiday with his, with his either with his new wife or his, whatever, his wife, or whatever. Uh, and they went up to the, they w- walked up to the, they were at the airport, and they walk up, walked up to the desk and they said, uh, we're on flight. So, so. And the woman behind the counter said, okay, have you got your passports? And they turned to him and said, you, Perry, you got your passports? And he went, um, no, no. It's, it's the, the bloke has them. What bloke? Uh, the passport guy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and a lot of them struggle for a long time. Yeah, I can because... see why. I can see. Why. I mean, people say it's privilege. What it is, what it is. If they're getting everything done for them, which we well, do as of well, course, because what what they don't want is they don't want you to be responsible for any of that. No, all they want you to be thinking about is playing football. Yeah, no, we'll yeah. we'll organise all the travel. We'll, we'll find you somewhere to live. Don't worry about that. Yeah, and all you've got, as you say. Be, be here in the right clothes. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. I mean, with us, yeah. Like, you know, be here in the right clothes. There you go. You, you go into so-and-so. Everything's been booked for you. All you have to do is turn up at the airport. Do you know what I mean? It's usually someone will take everybody's passports and stuff. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah. And of course they do, yeah. And you a get, very, what is it, a movement order. Yeah. When, we, when, I, when I started yeah, doing yeah, we do, yeah, yeah. The, the decompression gigs, one of my mates of a comic phoned me up and said, Bob, I've just had a movement order. What the? F- <laughs> what is a movement order? When is thirteen twenty five? Why is the date written like this? Um, yeah. <laughs> I've got to tell you who's. Um, um, did you know if this Rich Jones? His name is. He's a um, Rich Rich Jones. He's been doing a few podcasts. He's an ex soldier that became um, quite quite a big drug dealer kind of thing. Oh, but okay. it, it, even he was saying. I'm reading this book at the moment. Even he was saying that at the height of his career stuff, like criminal career, he was just thinking, I wish that I could go back to the army when everything was so simple. It was harder, but so much simpler, such a simple life, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah there guess, is a thing that institutionalization is, is a real thing. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. And that's why, that's why people struggle when they come out of the services, but by the same token, it's why people struggle when they've been like professional footballers. Yeah. And suddenly they're not the suicide rate. Is it big? Is oh, it amongst? Are they, well, not even that. The early death rate yeah. amongst football is ridiculous. Because imagine being super fit, which you you yeah. you've got to be, however much we slag about. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, look at him; he's fat. He's no good. I promise you, they're not. Yeah, and they yeah. are super fit to play in the Premier League. You've got oh, to be, it's got to be you know, insane. Different level. Now imagine doing that, and then suddenly not doing it. Yeah. Friday, you were doing it, and you've been doing it for seven, ten years. Monday, you're not doing it anymore. It's a, sh- it's a really short career, isn't it? Yeah. You know, people say, I, I know it seems that, but I mean, my, I've, so I've been in the Navy for 12 and a half years, which is pretty much a, a football career's length, and it's just flown by. Yeah. <laughs> I joined at 32, and all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm about to leave, and I'm in my 40s, what on earth has just happened? So... Yeah, it must, yeah I, can, I can see why it'd be difficult. For sportsmen in general, once they quit a sport, yeah, because you've been, you've, or, or your job has been being super fit. Yeah. And then you think, I don't have to anymore. Well, I'll tell you something. If you're normal like I was, yeah, it takes about 20 years to get fat. But if you're super fit, yeah, you can be fat within six weeks. Right. Because your body is thinking, well, seriously, if you don't use these calories, in it's the next the hour, shoom, we're going we're gonna to store them. And it, it's, uh, everything's, you know. It's interesting. Everything's relative, Ricky. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. What about well, driving? You're going to, so I've, been, I've been worried about you in the driving. What, what are you worried about? That you haven't got your paperwork through. Oh, you've been following me on Twitter. <laughs> Not following you, no, <laughs> no that sounds like a bit nonsense. Been... Well, I mean, it's just insane. I've got to, you know, I've got to get my licenses back. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, I, I gave them up when I sorted my drinking out. I had to give up my licenses for a bit. I know they're due back, that's no big deal. Yeah, there's, there's nobody at the DVLA, you know, but I, I, you know, you saw a little campaign that I went on where I was tagging every single MP in the country pretty much. 
um, and eventually they got back to me. So I think that's all going to get sorted. So I, the, the Navy, because I've done so long, they're retraining me now um, to be a heat pump engineer and air con engineer and mm. refrigeration engineer. That's my plan. But at the moment, with the way the country is and how much they're paying people to drive lorries, there's a high chance I just do that as well. So that, that should all be sorted pretty soon. I'm pretty relaxed about it. I leave in April. I'm um, quite relaxed about it. Everything's in place for me to leave. Too. Oh, next April. Yeah, yeah, I leave, I leave, I leave in. Yeah, I've still got a few months left. Everything's in place for me to transition. I think it's a lot better than what it used to be. This guy that I'm going to be interviewing tomorrow, he left the army and he was saying that they just gave him a pack with some courses on and that was his resettlement. With me, I'm I'm going off to Chester. No, not Chester. That's where you're from. I'm going to somewhere near Chester, I think it is, to go and do this, this course all pretty much i think i'm paying 700 quid it's it's about a three and a half grand course yeah. kind of thing you know the navy got me all of my licenses i'm uh, i'm going down the social housing route because i'm not actually middle class that's just for show and <laughs> uh yeah but i mean again i'm top of the list to move back up to the northeast to newcastle um so yeah everything's in place i've had a, i've had a really the, the navy has saved my life pretty much and people will be shocked at people that i work with because i'm not usually so complimentary about about things because i'm leaving you know at the end of it at the end of any relationship is usually a bit strained and obviously that's where i'm at now i've had enough basically i've done 12 12 and a half years and i've had enough and i want out but it's been you know i joined at 32 42 convictions i hadn't been homeless since my mid-20s but i was still shabbily i was always on the, the verge of homelessness yeah um crap job after crap job i could never hold a job down because i hated them all there that gave me a reputation as he doesn't hold a job down sure well, that's, yeah that's because i hate them all <laughs> do you yeah. know what i mean and when i joined the navy everyone was like oh that's not going to work out and i was saying I- i'm joining it because i can't i have to go to work if i join the navy you know like i have to do yeah. it and i joined they've been now but supportive since the first time i walked through the doors in newcastle careers office i've been all over the world got all my driving licenses freestone heavier i had really bad teeth when i joined up i had the teeth of somebody that had been a drug addict and a homeless man for absolutely years i had two missing they were all overcrowded i think i've had about 30 grand's worth of work done via the navy um so it's been great it's been great for me it's over i'm I'm leaving i'm looking forward to that that is fabulous i would recommend it to anybody if anybody saw uh, you know People, especially young young people, if they're sort of stuck and they don't really know where they're going in life and they're not sure what direction they want to go, join the forces for a bit. Work it out while you're getting paid um, to travel about and do things that not everybody gets to do. And I get it now that I'm in the bubble, I get it. It is different. I'm not a civilian. There is a difference. And I'll always be sort of part of that military family yeah. that I've been for the last 12 years. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's been good. It's been good. I'm glad I did it. But that's what people used to do when I grew up. Mm. I grew up in the 60s. So... Uh, you know, everyone, everyone knew someone who was in the army. Yeah, because that's what it did. You, had, you, you it, some kids would be so oh, clever. He's going to go to university. Very, very few. I, I only ever knew one person who went to university, but they're going to go further education. Yeah. I mean, so, but uh, and he's got an apprenticeship, and uh, Terry uh, he will stick you in the army. And and they did. Do you know they what, always they yeah. always wound up do you know, being do you know, the ones that the you only know, cri- did well. Yeah, the only criticism that I've got at the moment is that it seems that they've made it a bit too hard for people like myself to just walk in and say, "Look, can I join?" They've made it a bit too formal and a bit too uh, trying to be inclusive, which is a great thing. It feels like they're excluding the sort of rough and tumble person that would probably benefit and make a good military soldier sailor airman kind of thing do you know what i mean does that make sense you never see it on the ads do you no so on the ads now you haven't got some (laughs) sort of you know chavvy working class kid that doesn't really know what's going on going into the army careers can i join up what jobs have you got blah blah blah. then they should be go away and study that job come back in we'll talk from there at the moment it's all desperate to prove that they will take you know the yeah. people you, I, it, I get inclusiveness that's great but yeah. by being inclusive don't exclude the no, people exactly. that it could probably be a bigger benefit to. <laughs> yeah so yeah that's my thoughts on that Rick can I ask you something yeah you can ask me anything what's <laughs> written on your arm that there um uh, that 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 is a 
uh, there is a poem that was I don't know it I I know it but I don't I don't know it off heart it's um it's about first world war soldiers and where they die becoming hallowed ground what lies beneath oh, hallowed uh, ground Flanders field that's it yeah Flanders field um what what lies beneath what makes hallowed ground kind of thing and it's about yeah, yeah, yeah. just a, a soldier dying I actually got it because I took the last quote um to live in hearts is not to die. And I use that at my uncle's funeral. So my uncle was as close to a dad as I got. So when he dies, um, I read something out and I used that. But then from there, I went and found a poem and found out it was about First World War soldiers. And it sort of all tied in nicely with the military. Yeah, and okay. I've got it tattooed on my arm. Uh, at some point, it's going to blur and I'll have to get it covered up with something new. But yeah, I should really learn it off by heart so that I can impress yeah, people. Yeah, so when that they you, ask can, me. you can then say it. There's a brilliant phrase in the. Uh... Uh, well, you're Muslim, aren't you? No. Is your wife Muslim? Because no. my, <laughs> no. my wife's Muslim. No. No. I'm married um, into it. My, my wife's Sikh. Well, oh. she's, my wife's from a Sikh family, um, and her family are practicing Sikhs. I'm, oh, no, I, you, yeah, you yeah, mentioned I'm, Muslim because people think that's why you yeah, don't yeah, drink. I just, I put out I, I'm, I'm married into a Muslim family, yeah, which is one of the best things, you know, just because they're such wonderful, warm, and, you know, embracing people, which I never really had. But um, there's, a, there's a wonderful thing in, about someone... Uh, uh, a man dies twice. The first time is when the, the last breath leaves his body. Yeah. And the second time is the last time someone mentions his name. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, no, I, I do believe I, I love believe, that. Yeah, I do believe I do. I'm sort of, it, I think because of the age I'm at, like hit my mid 40s and I've sobered up, you know, which is a big thing. And all of a sudden I'm like, we don't get long. Life goes pretty quick. Um, yeah. I really need to pull my finger out and do something to leave something you know, so that when I'm gone, like like that, when I'm gone, I want my kids to have fond memories of me when I when yeah. I'm not here. Um, because we you know, going back right to the start, I didn't grow up in a very nice environment. And uh when I look back at my mum's life, it's a very sad thing. You know, yeah. I, I don't I get no joy from remembering my childhood or remembering my mother in her death. It's not it's something I try to avoid doing. I don't want that. I want my kids to look back. Sure. And grieve, but actually smile about the life, the smile about their dad and who I was as a yeah. person, you know, and, you know, look back and think, wasn't he a good dad? Wasn't he, didn't he do well while he was here kind of thing? So, yeah, that's sort of where I'm focused at the moment, to be honest. Yeah, it's the best. Seriously, I've got two kids now and they're both grown up. But one of the, one of the things I'm most proud of in my life is, A, is they both get on. Yeah. You know, I come from a family where, you know, my brother hasn't spoken to my mum for this long. You know, yeah. People fall out. But yeah. my, my two kids, there's seven years between them, but they get on really, they go out together. You know, they meet up a lot and stuff like that. And I know they, I know that they like me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Which that's is, a fabulous yeah, thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is a good thing. Yeah, my my best friend, so the, the, the young lad that helped me set all this up um, is actually my best mate's. Uh, son and my best mate's Greek he's half Greek and his yeah. family is the same they're so close they're as good they're as close to a family as I got because when I was growing up through the chaos that, that I used to stay at their house all the time um, but they're such a close family and they're sort of who I look at to use as an example do you know that's what I want I want yeah I want them to like me they love them they love their mum and dad do you know what I mean they adore yeah. them and yeah that's like I said I just you don't get long life seems to be going really quick <laughs> Uh, you always get to my <laughs> age, boy. Well, how, how, how old are you now? 64. 64, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it just feels like yesterday I was in my mid-20s and all of a sudden yeah. I'm, I'm 45, coming up to 45. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but, you know, I'm doing what I can. I'm going to leave. I'm going to try and go self-employed and make a decent bit of money. And Well, driving's the thing at the moment. Driving it? is the thing, yeah. I've got this as a little hobby on the side rather than drinking myself unconscious all the time. So, yeah, fingers crossed. All right, Rick. There out. you go. Brilliant. Do you not Thanks. wind up now? Do you not have a little wind up speech? Uh, I don't. I. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Am I supposed to? This is. Just, you know, <laughs> no, no I reason. Know, like, I just. I wing this. I'm just. I think John. John Peel. I feel like I'm the John Peel of the podcasting world. Like, oh, you know, I don't I love John Peel. I don't. You know. I don't really know what I'm doing. I just like talking to people. There you go. <laughs> you know, I like talking to people. I suppose I should say if people are watching, um, subscribe to the YouTube channel and share it there is a facebook channel it's a facebook page but i don't i don't see how that i don't see the point people like it but i don't know what happens from there subscribe no. to the youtube channel apparently that's the big thing is i need people to subscribe so 
if you're watching, subscribe. Uh, um, yeah, thank you, Ricky. Listen, no. anytime you want to do the radio, do my show. <laughs>